Dear friends in Jesus, we have another lesson from the book of Revelation, and if you understand the book of Revelation, it's, it's almost like looking at a series of slides or a slideshow. And in that slideshow, you're going to get different scenes uh, describing what the life is going to be like from the time Jesus ascended into heaven until he comes again on the last day. And for example, you're going to have one scene where it talks about plagues and death and war and all the catastrophes that we have in this life. And then in the next slide, in the next scene, you, you see that the saints are kept safe in God's keeping. In one scene, you'll see all the terrible false doctrine that infects the church and, and makes war against the saints. But in the next scene, you'll see how the gospel will be preached to the very end of the age. In Revelation chapters 19 and 20, for example, we have the description of what it's going to be like on Judgment Day, especially for the unbelievers. And it's scary. And then that's followed by Revelation 21 and 22 that talks about what's going to happen to believers and how God's people will be gathered and kept safe in heaven. And chapter 21 is where we have our text for today. And if there's one phrase that uh, I want you to remember, it's that phrase, I'm making everything new. We like new things, don't we? The smell of a new car, and uh, the way a new car rides, and, or, or a brand new house, nothing's broken, it doesn't have to be fixed, at least for a little while. We like a new set of clothes, a new suit, a new dress. We, we like new things. And God says that when Jesus comes again on the last day, he's going to make everything new. And what does that mean? He describes this very beautifully in our text. We read in our first verse, <clears throat> Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So when you see the word heaven, don't think about the place where the angels are. Think about the sky. And, and just as in creation, in the first in the book of Genesis, he, he created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, right? And now it says he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. So he's going to restore all of his creation back to its pristine state before man's fall into sin. And I don't know if we can begin to appreciate just how much the world has been affected by that fall into sin. The Apostle Paul hit on this in his letter to the Romans. He said, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And that's that last day, where the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And so this world is decaying. And we see that all around us. We, we see it in, in God's creation. It's all wearing down. And there's terrible things that happen. There are earthquakes, and there are floods, and there are tsunamis, and there are hurricanes. And there's diseases, not only in human life, but in plant life, and animal life, and and there's animals going into distinction, and people are cutting down rainforests just to turn it into plywood, and you could go on and on and on. But when Jesus comes again on the last day, he's going to make everything new. He's going to restore everything, his creation. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Can you imagine what it will be like? This world is a pretty nice place, but if you take out all the bad stuff, it'd be a wonderful place. He's gonna make everything new. But there's one phrase there, he says, and there was no longer any sea. And, and that has puzzled commentaries, uh, com, com, um, people who study the Bible. Why wouldn't there be an ocean in heaven or in the new earth? You'd think that ocean's a beautiful place. Why wouldn't there be an ocean? And uh, I had a professor at the seminary, Dr. Sigbert Becker, and he had his own idea about this. He wrote one of the best commentaries on the book of Revelation there is, probably the best. And he said he believed that that little phrase was there, especially for John, to comfort John in where he was at life. You see him sitting on the beach. So he was an island 
on an island called Patmos, which was a prison island, and he was 30 miles from Ephesus, and on a good day he could look across the sea and see the city of Ephesus where he had been a pastor for 40 years. And when you've been a pastor for 40 years in one place, you really get to love the people tremendously, don't you? And so he just longed to be there, and there he's stuck on this island. And God said, there won't be any more sea. You won't be separated for your love, from your loved ones ever again. And I think that's one of the beauties of heaven. You won't be separated from your loved ones ever again. And here in this world, we always get separated by something. Sometimes we're separated by distance. One might live on the west coast and the other on the east coast and we're in between. Or one might live in a foreign country. Or maybe it's just separated by a couple of hundred miles, but that means you only get to see one another maybe four or five or six times a year. And of course, the greatest separator, that's death, right? That separates us permanently from our loved ones. Well, maybe not permanently, but only for this life. And so, this is a beautiful thought that when we get to heaven someday, we won't be separated from the ones we love. We go on. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So this holy city, this new Jerusalem, that's a picture of the church, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints. And in the Old Testament, everybody worshiped and gathered in Jerusalem. And so that, in a sense, was the church. And in the New Testament, the new Jerusalem is God's church, all true believers in Jesus. And it's coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The Apostle Paul uses that same picture in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And I don't think you feel like that, do you? holy and blameless and without stain or wrinkle or blemish because you commit sins every day and so do I. And so we see ourselves as sinful. But if Jesus has washed away your sins, if you've been washed in the waters of your baptism and if you've been robed with the robes of Jesus' righteousness, he sees you as his bride. And just put, put in your mind, maybe your wedding day, and when, when the bride comes down the aisle and she's dressed in that beautiful white gown and everybody just goes, <gasps> and that's how Jesus sees you. Even if you can't see yourself that way, that's how Jesus sees you. The beauty of being in heaven someday is that's how we're going to see ourselves. As a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. There's something else here that, that's important. Uh, about this, this phrase, this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. That's the church, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints. One of the things that sin has caused in this world is division within God's church. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were just one church in the whole world? But we know what causes those divisions. It's, it's false teachings, and that, that's what causes the separations. But Every believer from no matter what denomination they come from is a member of God's holy Christian church. Only we can't see that. We can't see the, the faith in people's hearts. But we see Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists and Presbyterians and, and we're all divided. But not in heaven. There's going to be just one church in heaven and we will be perfectly united. Can you imagine that? God is going to make everything new. And then he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Think back to the Garden of Eden when God would come to Adam and Eve and walk and talk with them in the garden. But because of their sin, they were separated from God. And... When we're in heaven someday, we'll get to walk and talk with God. We will be with him and he will be with us. And then it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the 
old order of things has passed away. <coughs> the old order of things. <coughs> you're born, you're young, you have family, you get old, and you die. That's the order of things, isn't it? Death is always at the end of the road. Maybe on Memorial Day weekend, you'll take a trip to the cemetery. When you take that trip to the cemetery, just walk around instead of just looking at the grave of your loved one. But when you're there, remember that when Jesus comes again, he's going to raise that person from the dead and you will be reunited with them. But then take a trip and look at, the, at all the other stones and see how some died when they were 15 and some died when they were 95. And sometimes there's almost whole families in a row. Sometimes those gravestones, especially old ones, will tell a story in the cemetery that <clears throat> my parents are buried in back home. There's one gravestone that's from like 1870, 18, about 1870, and it was about a, a Civil War veteran. And it, it's a whole poem on the gravestone, and it says, and Johnny, Johnny grew up on the farm, and he loved farming, and then he went off to war, and he fought terrible battles, and he was wounded terribly, but he survived, and he came home, and he lived on the farm, and then he went out to the woods, and he cut down a tree, and the tree fell on him, and he died. And you think, what a sad story. He survived the Civil War, and he comes home only to have a tree fall on him and die. That's the old order of things. That's the sadness that's in this life. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. God will make everything new. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Write it down. And, and, and John did. You, you've heard people say, well, would you put that in writing? You know, I... I Sometimes I wish that I had a contract with the Social Security uh, Administration. They seem to change the rules from time to time. They told me I was gonna retire at 65 and now you have to wait till 66 or 67. And you wonder if there's going to be enough money in Social Security for the next 10 or 20 years. I wish they would write it down and I, I could have a contract. God wants us to be sure. God wants to have no doubts in our minds. He says, write this down because these words are trustworthy and true. And then God says, he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He said, uh, first of all, the Alpha and the Omega. You'll find that in the beginning of Revelation chapter one, in chapter 22, and then also here in chapter 21. I'm Alpha and Omega. I am the first letter of the alphabet and the last letter of the alphabet. I'm A to Z. I, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. And what's interesting about this is if, if you have a Jehovah's Witness friend and you want to prove to them that Jesus really is God, you take him to the first time it says this in Revelation in chapter 1. And it says that the Alpha and the Omega is Jehovah God. And, and if you use their translation, it actually works better. Alpha and Omega is Jehovah God. And if you go to the last chapter, chapter 22, it says Alpha and Omega, and then it says I, Jesus. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And so Jesus is saying to him who is, thir first of all, he says it's done. What's done? Everything that's necessary for your salvation is done. There's nothing left for you to do. And he says, to him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. You don't have to buy your way to heaven. Jesus bought your ticket. <coughs> Jesus paid for your reservation. And, and, and you can be absolutely sure that there's a place waiting for you. <coughs> I'm going to make everything new, he says. I don't know about this last spring rain, it was a little bit hard last night, but maybe the first rain we had last week. Did you go outside and just take a, a breath of fresh air and all the dirt was 
washed out of the atmosphere and everything smelled like it was brand new and the blossoms <coughs> smelled and it was just beautiful for about 10 minutes. In heaven, God will make everything new and it will 